This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Robert Reich, who is the Chancellor's Professor of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. He has served in three national administrations, most recently as Secretary of Labor under President Bill Clinton. He has written 13 books, including The Work of Nations, Locked in the Cabinet, Supercapitalism, and his most recent book is Aftershock. Bob, welcome to our program. Thank you, Harry. Where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, I was raised in uh, South Salem, New York, a little town uh, about 60 miles north of New York City. At that time, farm country. My friends were mostly farmers. My, my father had a little uh, woman's clothing shop. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, my father, for most of that time, was a, a Republican, a, a Rockefeller Republican a liberal Republican, uh, an oxymoron today. There aren't any liberal Republicans left. Um, he was very concerned about the budget deficit. I remember the first thing he told me when I must have been about four years old. He said, Bobby, you and your children and your grandchildren will be repaying the debt that Franklin D. Roosevelt created. And I had no idea what a debt was, but I was scared to death. And I, uh, But my my boys have never mentioned FDR's debt, and I have a new granddaughter who has not yet talked about it, so I don't think that my father was right in that instance, although he was right about most things. And uh, my mother uh, didn't have strong political beliefs uh, one way or another, but she had a very strong uh, kind of moral compass in terms of what was right and wrong and kind of social responsibility. And was there discussion of politics around the dinner table? Not much. The, the big issue we talked about around the dinner table was uh, uh, the sales of, of, of blouses and slacks and brassiers. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I, I believe I read somewhere that your grandmother uh, was a, a real organizer in the oh. small community that she lived? Oh, she was. Uh, my mother's mother was a, was a tremendous organizer, uh, community organizer. I don't think she would style herself as a community organizer, but um, wherever she went, she if, she if something didn't seem right to her or the community needed to do something, she'd just get everybody involved. So where were you uh, educated? Uh, public high school in South Salem, uh, actually Cross River, New York, uh, John Jay High School. A Lewisboro Elementary School, before that, wonderful little public uh, elementary school. Miss Boughton's uh, Nursery School, before that, not a good experience. <laughs> uh, and then after oh, high school, I went to uh, Dartmouth College. Uh, after that, I was fortunate enough to get a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford, and then I went to law school at Yale. And when were you bitten by the economics bug? Uh, I was always fascinated by economics, not so much as economics per se, but as sort of a one key into, or, uh, into understanding the, you, you might say, the, the, the macro organization of society, um, uh, law and political science, politics, economics. It all was very interesting to me because I, I really wanted to understand the substructure. I mean, what was the, the system? that held us together or didn't hold us together. Um, and that was from a very early age. I, I, uh, I had some very brilliant teachers in retrospect who got me interested in all this. Uh, and then um, uh, the summer before I went to college, uh, one friend, a mentor, uh, a few years older, um, who had been, been very involved in civil rights, uh, went to Mississippi and he was murdered uh, trying to register black voters. This was uh, uh, Schwerner? Mickey, or? Yeah, Mickey yeah, Schwerner. Schwerner. Yeah. And I think that 
kind of shocked me into the realization that uh, these issues that I had been playing with were not really playthings. Uh, there were very large questions, um, life and death struggles going on in terms of civil rights, uh, and then after that, uh, Vietnam and so forth. Uh, remember, this was an era of Martin Luther King, uh, John F. Kennedy had been president, uh, Bobby Kennedy. Uh, I was not alone. I think most people who were my age uh, were bitten by this bug, you know, that society had wrongs and it was our obligation to try to right them. Uh, uh, just a side point here, because one of the things that emerges in, in your many works is your your skills as a writer. Where did you hone uh, that that craft as a writer? Did this? Where, where did you learn to write so well? Was it just a natural gift? Well, you're very kind to say um, say ask that question or make that implication. I I, I always uh, wrote. Even I uh, remember as a as a as a child, six, seven, eight years old, I was always writing. Um, I I can't say. I, I can't point to a particular influence. I can't say that there was anything that I felt was particularly unusual about it. I I just always enjoyed writing. I don't think there was a time when I didn't uh, feel like I have to, I had to write. What about your sense of humor? That's the other thing that really stands out. Uh, uh, did you always have that, or can you pinpoint a source? Uh, I, let's see, my father, who, uh, by the way, um, is just turned 97, and he still is very funny. He's very, in fact, he's getting funnier. Um, intentionally, not unintentionally. I mean, there's some 97-year-olds who are unintentionally funny, but he is really very funny. He's very sarcastic, but in a, with a real glint in his eye. So I credit him uh, with a lot of that. And his father was also uh, very funny. There was just a, uh, it wasn't jokes, but there was a kind of a, a sardonic humor. Um, uh, not slapstick. But uh, exaggeration sometimes, and um, and again, a, a, a kind of friendly, good-natured sarcasm that I grew up with. Now, when did you meet the Clintons? When uh, Bill, you met when you were a Rhodes Scholar. Yes, in those days, uh, we took a boat together, uh, a ship across the Atlantic, disembarked from New York. Uh, I mean, embarked from New York, uh, went to uh, London. Uh, ultimately, and uh, it was a miserable journey that October. I, I don't recommend anybody cross the Atlantic if they can avoid it by ship. Uh, I don't know why we all f did it. That was a tradition. I, I guess that's how you l met the other Rhodes Scholars. Uh, and Bill Clinton, I got ter terribly seasick, as I think most, most of us did. And um, there was a knock on my door, and he appeared there with chicken soup in one hand and some crackers in the other, and uh, he said, I hear you weren't feeling too well. I, I, I didn't know him uh, at all. I'd met him very briefly in New York, and uh, we started a friendship. He, he did not say by the, at that time, uh, I feel your pain. Th that came later for him. But um, we, uh, we enjoyed talking. It, it, talking with Bill Clinton in those days was very much like talking with Bill Clinton uh, later in my life. It wasn't really talking with, it was listening to. Uh, he was a great raconteur, a great storyteller. Um, he, he basically wanted, he loved audiences, <laughs> and, and I was delighted to give him an audience. Um, I was amazed at that time. I mean, on that trip, he told me that he planned to become governor of Arkansas. Now, for a 22-year-old, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing next week, uh, you know, and the idea that uh, he had already plotted a, at least the beginning of a political career struck me as absolutely amazing. And then you met uh, Hillary uh, at the Yale Law School, where both you and Bill at attended? Actually, I'd known Hillary before. I, I met her when she was an undergraduate at Wellesley, 
and I was uh, an undergraduate at Dartmouth, I think a year ahead of her. Um, I had forgotten this. Uh, during uh, the presidential campaign, when she ran in the Democratic primary, uh, some reporter from the New York Times called me and said that he had found a, uh, some of her letters, undergraduate letters, um, alluding to the fact she had uh, come up to Dartmouth uh, as my date. Mm -hmm. I, I completely forgot, I, I mean, it was not obviously terribly memorable, but the reporter asked me, is there anything you can remember about that occasion? And I, I, I just, first of all, I was stunned that uh, it had happened, and I thought back, and it gradually dawned on me that we did go to a movie. Um, she was president of her freshman class. I was president of my sophomore class. I think I had ensnared her to come up by talking about it as a presidential summit. <laughs> I was very clever in those days. And uh, the only thing I could say to the reporter was um, uh, she wanted an inordinate amount of, pop of butter on her popcorn, uh, which I thought, you know, I did it tongue in cheek. And then there was a long pause. Um, and I thought, hello, are you still there? He said, I'm just writing this down. And it appeared in the New York Times. And, and looking the quality, back, how, the quality of American political reporting. How do you compare Bill and Hillary uh, as policy wonks and as politicians? Well, that's a very complicated question, Harry. Um, uh, Bill uh, is. Uh, I mean, just a huge extrovert. He's the, I mean, you have to be uh, a wild extrovert to enjoy politics. And by that I mean uh, every human interaction has to give you more energy uh, than you put into it. So that by the end of a day, after you've uh, talked or shaken hands with thousands of people, uh, you actually end up with more energy than you had at the start. Uh, I, I could never do that. I once ran for, uh, office and I would be exhausted at the end of the day. So he's uh, really, he's an extrovert. He loves to, as I said before, tell stories. He loves to interact. He has a voracious appetite and energy. Um, a little bit undisciplined. That's not a new insight. Many of his uh, biographers have have found that. Uh, Hillary is very much more disciplined. She's, she's, a, she th she's a linear thinker. He's kind of a uh, uh, you know, he, he surveys the terrain. Um, she is uh, uh, careful about her time. Uh, she listens much more carefully. Uh, I would say overall, she is uh, not only more disciplined, but I dare say she, although she's an extrovert, she's not nearly as much of one. Were, were these differences apparent when they were both students with you at the Yale Law School? Or do these insights come later? Well, I, I wouldn't have been able to talk uh, with as much certainty about them. Um, you know, at the age of 22, 23, all of these things are embryonic. Uh, their tendencies, uh, uh, I think I would have said then uh, that she, just in, sh in terms of sheer intellectual firepower, she was probably uh, uh, ahead of Bill Clinton. When you teach in the School of Public Policy here, what, what do you teach your students is the difference between polity, policy and politics? I try to uh, integrate the two. That is, uh, in, uh, I've been a, a, a policy official, let's put it that way, in Washington uh, three times. Uh, actually several, four times. Uh, once I, uh, under Robert Bork, in the uh, Ford administration, I, I argued Supreme Court cases and I've reviewed Supreme Court briefs. Uh, and then in the Carter administration, I was director of policy planning for the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and then uh, I came in uh, as uh, Bill Clinton's uh, Secretary of Labor, and then I've, I've had advisory roles since then. Uh, and what I've learned about policymaking is you cannot separate it from politics. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's a kind of uh, hubris that some policymakers have that somehow it's all about finding the best policy and then doing end runs around democracy and politics uh, to get it done. Uh, 
I think that's hubris because I think democracy really does have a lot to tell us as policymakers. Politics has a lot to tell us about what is the nature of the good. Uh, it's not just analysis. Uh, let me show your book, because I went back for this interview and read, and I recommend very highly, Locked in the Cabinet, the story of, of your tenure in uh, the Clinton administration. And I guess what I want to ask you is, what did you learn about the interface between theory and practice as you took the role of Secretary of the Labor. Were, were you surprised as you learned these things about, oh, this, this idealism, this theory, it, when the tire hits the road? Well, I, I didn't learn that. I, I didn't learn that idealism is sort of foolish or has to take a back seat. I, I thought, quite the contrary, it was very important to hold on to your ideals because um, uh, there are such powerful headwinds constantly uh, uh, forcing you into some sort of compromise that unless you remember your ideals and go back to them, uh, like you go back to a, 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 a well, uh, you can easily be completely sidetracked. You can be worse than sidetracked. You can be just off in a ditch. Uh, so idealism is very important. Uh, I had been teaching uh, kind of public policy at the Kennedy School at Harvard for 12 years before I took the labor secretary job. So I had a wealth of, uh, of theory and uh, you know, what, let's put it this way, what one teaches in public policy schools behind me. Uh, the biggest surprise, I think, Harry, uh, was how exhausting those jobs are. And nobody, I mean, I never taught about how to maintain your energy. Not just idealism, but just 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 stay fully functioning and um, uh, not be uh, torn apart by uh, all of these forces uh, and not come home late at night and just uh, be overwhelmed. I mean, resilience, uh, physical and mental resilience is tremendously important if you want to make a difference. Now, believe me, there are people in Washington, I. I'm sad to say, who like the job title or like having the power, uh, who don't take the jobs uh, perhaps as seriously as they should. Uh, Washington is a funny town, Harry. It's a town where people uh, don't take issues as seriously as they should in many instances, take themselves too seriously. I tried desperately to do the opposite. I tried not to take myself too seriously, but to take the issues really seriously. You, you write in Locked with the Cabinet, let me read you, uh, politicians cannot be pure by definition. Their motives are always mixed. Ambition, power, public adulation always figure in somehow. Means get confused within. And then now you're talking about Bill Clinton. Will Bill stick to his ideals in the pinch, or will I find myself compromised simply by virtue of being connected to his compromises, uh, sort of an insightful view of politics and where things might go. Do you, do you, do you still stick with that description? Well, the, yes, in the sense that uh, there is a continuous tug between means and ends to the point where uh, some people uh, in political life simply lose track. Uh, it all becomes means. They, they forget what the ends are. Uh, this is what I was referring to a moment ago when I said uh, just reminding yourself of your ideals, reminding yourself why you're there. Because unless you have the capacity to continuously refresh that deep understanding, then you can become trapped in the means. Uh, then you can be, uh, become trapped in uh, subtle ulterior motives that gradually take over your brain. Mm -hmm. uh, when I read your account of those years and the influence of Rubin and, and Greenspan, uh, I was, uh, I had the following thought, which was, whenever a liberal is elected president 
or somebody that the progressives might put a great deal of stock in. They, they, this book should, your book should be required reading to, to lower the expectations of the change that, that you hope they're going to bring, bring about. So I guess my question is this, w because you had experienced this, were you less surprised by some of the disappointments that progressives felt about President Obama when he dealt with the crisis? Well, I think that uh, regardless of where you are on the political spectrum, I think there are many, uh, uh, you know, conservatives uh, who are continuously disappointed by Republican presidents. Uh, the fact of the matter is that presidents have a very difficult time leading. You know, uh, as that old metaphor goes, it's like drinking out of a fire hose. You're lucky if you can even uh, take a gulp. Uh, let alone find your balance. Uh, nothing good happens in Washington, in my experience, unless people outside Washington are mobilized and energized and activated and pushing on elected leaders. Uh, even uh, a president with the best of motives, uh, if there is not that pressure, uh, if all the pressure is coming from, say, corporations or very wealthy people who are supporting uh, through campaign donations, then that president is not going to be able to overcome uh, that, uh, that powerful trajectory. Uh, uh, there is nothing more important than organizing, mobilizing, activating, energizing people who share your views if you want the people in Washington to act on those views. Now, as, as Secretary of Labor, uh, how did you try to mobilize constituencies for the programs that you sought? Was it only the labor unions you could turn to to, to get the kind of policies that you were advocating uh, in the administration, for example, training of workers for new kinds of jobs and so on? Uh, well, it was difficult to mobilize from Washington. Uh, that's my point. I, I used every th possible handle lever I could. I mean, I, you know, I, I traipsed around the Capitol every day uh, talking to members of Congress. I met with every interest group you can imagine. Uh, I went out into the country, talked to people. Uh, I tried to use the media a lot, uh, talk shows in terms of just making the arguments. Uh, but I personally, as a cabinet official, could not go out and organize people. I mean, they had to take that responsibility. So, for example, the day that Bill Clinton signed um, his welfare bill, uh, which I thought was at the time, and I still worry about it, I thought it was wrong. I, I think that it still um, subjects too many people to the vagaries of the economy, and uh, we need some fundamental safety net that is not there now. The, the day he signed that, uh, I expected, as I walked out of the White House, to see some people on the streets. Everybody knew he was going to uh, make a decision that day. And I don't mean signing it. I mean the day he made the decision. He signed it subsequently. Everybody knew. The papers were filled with the fact that this was the day he was making this decision. He was meeting with his cabinet. We all were going to have our say. But on the streets of Washington, um, uh, there was nobody. I walked up Pennsylvania Avenue, Harry, and I will never forget the silence, deafening silence. And I thought to myself, well, it's foreordained. You know, we, we uh, the advocates for the poor and the poor, there's no national association of poor people in this country. Uh, how are we ever going to do the right thing by the nation's poor? Uh, as I read Locked in the Cabinet, <clears throat> the thought that came to my mind that was, were you the George Ball of domestic policy? And I should remind our younger audience that George Ball w opposed the, the Vietnam War, and he, he was sort of integrated into the process in such a way that when they would go around the table in the Johnson administration to talk about the war, Every, he would get a time to be listened to, but nobody was really listening. Was that your dilemma? And what was the frustration like? Well, one has to be very careful not to fall into the George Ball trap, because if you uh, are predictable in what you're going to say, uh, you can easily be marginalized. 
uh, people will stop listening. Uh, you have to be uh, true to your own values, but be uh, take every opportunity to be unpredictable. That is to come out, uh, again, true to your own values with something that people find interesting or a little bit um, different than they would have expected. Uh, otherwise, nobody's going to listen. Mm -hmm. and, and there was that potential problem. I mean, I, 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 dis I found myself, uh, certainly after several years in that office, uh, as uh, a fairly lonely voice. Uh, I tried to make alliances with others uh, in the cabinet and others uh, in government who shared my views, my values, which I thought at the time, and I still believe, were basically correct. I, you know, we have to build the wages and incomes of working people in this country. Uh, they have been stagnating for 30 years. Uh, the rich are getting richer. I'm talking about people at the very top. Not, I'm not blaming them. Uh, but we are becoming a less and less equal society, and I saw it beginning to happen. Uh, and uh, I wanted to do everything I could to uh, enlist others in the mission mm -hmm. of reversing that trend. Uh, and it was very frustrating not to have um, many allies. Uh, it's interesting, as I reread Locked in the Cabinet, it, it, was, it was quite amazing how many of the issues that come up now in trying to understand uh, the, the Great Recession, as you call it, the issues were there back then. I mean, the, the economy hadn't collapsed, but the, the problems of, of the, the structural inequality and so on. L let's talk now about your argument in, in Aftershock. Uh, and then I, I guess I just read that your paperback edition of Super Capitalism is coming out, so I'll show that. Uh, oh, you uh, show everything. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. right. Actually, the paperback of Aftershock is coming out uh, very, very okay. shortly. Tell Super me. Capitalism has been out already, um, but sometimes with, you know, writing a book uh, has its own, for me, pleasure. Marketing a book is not <laughs> particularly pleasurable. I don't, I don't mean, you know, I, I really feel like Chalmers that. Johnson, the late Chalmers Johnson, told me to show the books. So Good, I, thank I, you. I, yeah, we're doing that. So, so what, you, you're really making an argument about structural changes in the economy. You're trying to tell us that uh, what happened was not the result of a business cycle. But, but rather sort of basic changes. Let, let's help us understand it, because we had a great prosperity and we lost it. Why? The great prosperity, as I define the period after the Second World War that went on for about 30 years, uh, was not perfect. I mean, you know, there was a struggle to bring women into the economy, to bring blacks and minorities into the economy, but at least we were struggling. At least we were making every effort. Um, and it was a period of time in which uh, people in the bottom 20 percent, bottom 40 percent of the income ladder actually saw their incomes double, uh, sometimes better than that. Uh, there was a great deal of upward mobility. Uh, we as a country invested in education like mad. We invested in infrastructure, the National Defense Highway Act. Uh, we dedicated ourselves to the ideal of equal opportunity. And we actually began moving in that direction. Uh, we had a marginal income tax on the top income earners during the Eisenhower administration of 91 percent. Nobody would have accused Dwight Eisenhower of being a socialist. I assure you. Uh, but then we reversed course. We reversed course for a number of reasons, uh, and it happened in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, partly it was because uh, globalization, technological change uh, began to take away a lot of the good jobs. Uh, it began to undermine unions. Uh, these forces uh, I don't, 
you know, I'm not in, in favor of protectionism, I'm not in favor of being a neo-Luddite and, and smashing all the machinery, but we as a nation did not adapt to these new forces. We didn't adapt our workforces to these new forces. Uh, we didn't um, uh, adapt our tax systems. Our, uh, we didn't provide wage subsidies. We didn't provide uh, different kinds of safety nets. We basically allowed all this to happen and we turned our back on all of it. We unleashed Wall Street, we privatized, we deregulated, we, we actually uh, made the situation more perilous for American workers. Uh, beginning in the late 70s and early 1980s, we lowered marginal income taxes on the very rich. Uh, we found ourselves, not surprisingly, with structural budget deficits. We pulled in our horns with regard to programs that were so important to average working people. Uh, and we made a bad situation far worse when the sad irony is that if we had understood what was happening and if we had the right leadership, we could have, it seems to me, enabled the vast majority of Americans uh, to prosper in this new world. You, in, in the argument, as I understand it, in supercapitalism is that during this period uh, uh, from the 70s on, uh, what you had was uh, we put a, a lot in making the investor and the consumer better off. So the, there were a lot of aspects to the technological and economic changes that you see as positive and as benefiting the consumer and the investor. But the citizen was left behind because, because uh, what you call super capitalism overwhelmed democracy. The citizen and the worker we're both left behind. I mean, we are both workers and citizens. So as consumers, and to the extent that we're investors, we did wonderfully well. We had the world. Uh, we had new technologies. Uh, but as citizens and as working people, uh, we were overwhelmed. Uh, many of us lost ground. Uh, most of us stagnated in terms of if you adjust for inflation. Uh, and politics became overwhelmed in turn by money from the very wealthy and from big corporations. Um, so that uh, the, 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 the power structure of our society was no longer capable of responding to the needs of us as citizens and as workers. Uh, and uh, not only did that cause problems in terms of stagnating wages and everything else, but what I began to realize is that it was a dead-end strategy. It was a dangerous strategy. The only way most people uh, could maintain their living standards was by first having uh, wives and mothers going to the paid workforce and then everybody working longer hours and then finally uh, going deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. Uh, which seemed painless as long as housing values were going up. You could have home equity loans, you could have a refinance your home, but inevitably that debt bubble would burst. Mm -hmm. And that is what happened to bring on the Great Recession. Uh, the Wall Street's uh, excesses, uh, Harry, were the proximate cause, but the underlying cause was that we just couldn't keep up this, 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 this charade any longer uh, of the vast middle class and working class having enough money uh, to maintain their living standards. And when that debt bubble really did burst, uh, people could no longer spend. And if they could no longer spend, the wheels of commerce basically come grinding to a halt. Uh, unemployment goes skyrocketing. Uh, you have to rely more and more on foreign markets. Uh, and that's where we are today. Uh, we're not really coming out of this great recession. This is the most anemic recovery from the deepest recession we've had since the Great Depression. And, and the key to understanding the change is the enormous inequality in income which developed over this, this period. Yes, in the, in the 1970s, by the late 1970s, the top 1% by income uh, was getting about 9% of total income. But then income began concentrating more and more and more. 
partly because globalization, partly because technology, partly therefore because all of the advantages adhered to people with the right education and right connections, but it was more than that. It was also a, a lot of money flowing to Wall Street and to CEOs. Uh, so that by 2007, uh, almost a quarter of all the nation's income, remember it had been 9% in, in the late 70s, by 2007, uh, 23 and a half percent of the nation's income went to the top one percent. During this 30-year period, they doubled their share of the nation's income. If you look at the top one-tenth of one percent, they tripled their share. Everybody else basically stagnated, adjusted for inflation. The only way Others could maintain their standard of living, as I said, was by going deeper and deeper and deeper into debt, which is not a sustainable strategy. Um, but you see, you can't keep an economy going on the basis of the spending of people at the top. They just don't, they don't, for one thing, they don't spend enough. I mean, being rich means you already have most of what you want. In, in the book, uh, you make the point in, in, in Aftershock that, that the, we, we need to relearn the lessons that we learned in the aftermath of the Depression, and you, you focus on the head of the Federal Reserve, appointed by Roosevelt, who, who basically uh, saw that you need to have demand to match mac, uh, mass production. Uh, Mariner Eccles, uh, his name is on the Federal Reserve Building in Washington. It is the Eccles Building. He was the Federal Reserve Chair from 1934 to 1948, and he understood the economy uh, earlier and better than Roosevelt or John Maynard Keynes or any of the advisors, Rexford Tugwell. I mean, he was saying. Mariner Eccles, in 1933, January of 33, before Roosevelt even got there, he was saying, look, uh, we've got to restructure the economy uh, so that average working people uh, get a larger share of the benefits of the growth of the economy. Uh, Roosevelt put many of those ideas into effect. You had the National Labor Relations Act uh, really empowering labor unions, requiring employers to bargain in good faith. You had a minimum wage, a 40-hour work week with time and a half for overtime, social security, unemployment insurance. All the things we take for granted today were the foundations laid in that period, and then on top of that, major public investments, particularly in the 1950s and 1960s, in infrastructure and in education. Uh, you had a high income tax on people at the top uh, to finance a lot of this. You had huge economic growth. But again, it was economic growth widely shared, widely shared, which sustained itself. It meant that most people could, again, turn around and buy. But it was not just consumption and consumption and consumption. It was also public goods, public goods. Uh, again, parks and playgrounds and public highways and public transportation and public schools and great universities that were public universities, like the one we are privileged to be a part of. Uh, and that's how we created a period of unbridled prosperity. Your, your three books are, are really uh, can help us walk through this period of, of drastic changes where we went from the great prosperity to the present dilemma. And, and I want to ask you, what makes the difference in whether things can change? Uh, and the first thing that comes to mind, is it the personnel that the presidents appoint? That, that are so influential? Is it the ideas that have developed so that, oh, we have to worry about deficits, we have to worry about uh, uh, things that keep us from focusing on the issues that you're trying to raise? Well, for one thing, it is the personnel, which are a function of the president's values. Uh, number two, uh, it is the uh, dominant idea or the dominant ideas at a given time in terms of what is the essential problem, what is the deep problem. Uh, third, it's what people out there are concerned about, what they're hollering about. Uh, you know, it, 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 is, is there a movement out there in the public to do something about something? Uh, 
And finally, uh, it's, and this is the toughest thing to understand, and I, I go back and forth as sort of uh, somebody who's very interested in political and economic history, I'm trying to understand, it's almost the zeitgeist. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's something that is deeper than the two th or three or four year period marking a presidential term of office. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that characterizes an era uh, attitudes, understandings, um, assumptions. So deficits are important. A deregulation must be done to unleash capitalism. Those kinds of ideas. Are what you're well, those ideas. Uh, you know, worrying about deficits. Um, uh, you know, they've been around for a long time. I mean, even when Franklin D. Roosevelt became president, uh, he promised. First thing he promised was to balance the budget. That's what Herbert Hoover tried to do. I, I mean, it had no bearing at all on getting out of the Depression. In fact, trying to balance the budget when you have that much underutilized capacity is the last thing you want to do. I mean, government, government is the spender of last resort. But he didn't understand that. And it's very easy to, particularly in times of stress, to analogize a family budget to the nation's budget and say, okay, well, the reason we're in trouble is we spent too much. Uh, that's the reason a family is in trouble. Uh, they b live beyond their means, and so we as a nation have lived beyond our means. But you see the same theme cropping up every 15, 20, 30 years, uh, and the Republicans, of course, since uh, Ronald Reagan uh, and um, in England, Margaret Thatcher, have, have really glommed onto that. Barry Goldwater talked about that. Uh, but of course, um, experience should teach us otherwise. Uh, the same thing about privatization. Uh, privatization has been a conservative theme, a uh, major theme, uh, for 50, 60, 70 years. You see Herbert Hoover talking about it, uh, but then it, it gains prominence in 1980. Uh, Ronald Reagan, in terms of his values, his, his abilities to communicate, the people who he brought along, uh, the exhaustion of Keynesianism. I mean, remember, by the late 70s, we had double-digit inflation. Uh, nobody believed uh, in Keynesianism any longer, or seemingly. It, it, it just seemed like we, we, were, we were in a terrible state, stagflation. Uh, so we were prepared to believe something else. Privatization and deregulation seemed like it would deliver us. Lower taxes on the wealthy uh, will have trickle-down benefits. All of that proved to be <laughs> just, just a, a pipe dream, uh, but the country was ready for it. In, in the Clinton administration, you describe in, in your book uh, the idea that was afoot among the politicos that uh, we have to worry about the center. We have to find the center. And you make the interesting point that if you're a leader, you, you don't act from the center. You're actually moving the center. Today, we talk about marshalling the support of the independents. And that really, I think you're suggesting, locks us in to not moving to a new set of ideas. Well, a, a true leader uh, cannot lead people to the center because they're already there. I mean, you can't lead people to where they already are because they are already there. It's not very profound. If you want to lead, you can't look at the polls. You've got to lead the polls. You've got to change the polls. Uh, and um, we have presidents uh, like Ronald Reagan or even George W. Bush uh, who have very strong ideas and who essentially say, partly because they are pig-headed and very stubborn uh, and will not listen to their political advisors. They say, well, I don't care. I, I believe this, and I'm going to lead people in this direction. And um, a lot of people come along. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, uh, presidents, very intelligent presidents. Uh, I mean, Bill Clinton is one, and Barack Obama is an extraordinary intelligent man. Um, but uh, they are so intelligent that they uh, see too many sides of an issue, and therefore uh, they're willing uh, to listen to the political advisors who say, well, the public really is over here. Uh, you can't go there. Uh, this is where you have to go, because this is where the public is. And they therefore lose, by default, their capacity to lead. Mm -hmm. You uh, 
look at sort of the opportunities for change, and you, you focus a lot on the backlash that's building, uh, people resenting the change in their, their status, they're uh, looking at how the wealthy are doing very well, they uh, resent the way the rules of the game seem to be uh, written uh, to uh, really not do justice to the what the expectations of the middle class and so on so so my understanding and please correct me is that that you really uh, see it important to, to educate the people who are the great beneficiaries of the present system to see this backlash coming and change their ways. Is that fair? Well, I, I, I would say it's slightly different. I, okay. um, uh, that is, there's a lot of anger out there. The Tea Party uh, was born out of anger toward the bailout of Wall Street. I, it's very interesting to me that uh, we had many people on the left who were furious about the bailout of Wall Street, many people on the so-called right, uh, but that bailout for many so-called Tea Partiers uh, became emblematic of the fact you can't trust government. Uh, you can't trust big business, you can't trust Wall Street, but you can't trust government in part because government's going to be co-opted by big business and Wall Street, and what you want is a small government uh, to avoid that kind of co-optation. And on the surface of it, that's not totally illogical. Uh, the problem there is if you don't have government, all you have left is big business and Wall Street. And then you have total co-optation. Uh, you have no potential countervailing power. Uh, but when people are that angry, Harry, uh, I think that they are willing to listen to demagogues who use their anger and direct it in all kinds of places uh, uh, toward people who become essentially scapegoats, uh, whether we're talking about immigrants, uh, extraordinary anti-immigrant feeling in this country now. Uh, uh, the Chinese, to some extent, are scapegoats. Uh, public employees uh, have become scapegoats, uh, unionized workers. Uh, uh, there's a, the, the anger is looking for people, uh, looking for groups. and. To that extent, it can be very dangerous for a society. Uh, the rich are not immune. Uh, and so what I've argued, and I argue in Aftershock, is that in economic terms, uh, uh, the very, very rich actually have more to gain from having a smaller share of a rapidly growing economy than a big share of an economy that's uh, anemic, uh, because there's not enough demand, because the middle class doesn't have the purchasing power to keep the economy going. And by the same token, uh, the rich have much more to gain from an economy and a politics that are based on, a, on collaboration and more goodwill uh, than they do from an economy and a politics that succumbs to uh, partisanship, rancor, uh, anger. Uh, not just because the rich themselves could be the, you know, the, the victims of anger, uh, no more because uh, a kind of society that is that, uh, 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 that fractured um, cannot, by definition, do what it needs to do uh, to uh, make itself whole, to embrace progress, to adapt to a different world. What will push us to see this reality in a, a in a way that changes the system? I'm, I'm I, I don't yet see myself uh, the the vehicle that will make this possible. The political leadership seems to be focused on the independence and, and not moving from the center. Uh, and uh, the unions, uh, as, as you point out, are, are not, uh, uh, do not have the, the power in society that they had during the Great Prosperity. So on the one hand, we're moving toward educating the public about issues. 
On the other hand, we have this emerging backlash. What, what will make the difference so that we'll come up with the kinds of solutions that you're talking about? You, you propose a, a reverse income tax, higher marginal tax rates on the wealthy, re, a reemployment system, college loans linked to subsequent earnings, Medicare for all. I mean, it's all very clear uh, what lies behind your argument, but, but how do you see that happening? Well, I, uh, let me just say, I don't think that we face a dearth of ideas on the left or the right or anywhere. I mean, there are ideas out there. Um, I think uh, the real question is political will. That's what you're asking. Uh, I, in my experience, have been surprised at moments in which, uh, at which the public seems to be galvanized by something. Uh, it may be deficit reduction. Uh, it may be anger at Wall Street. It may be uh, disgust with the Vietnam War. Uh, it may be civil rights. Whatever it is, there, there is a tipping point, a set of tipping points, where uh, the public does become galvanized, uh, positively or negatively. And those are opportunities. I think after uh, Wall Street began to implode at the end of uh, 2008, um, just as Barack Obama was becoming president, that was a, a real opportunity. Uh, let's call it a teaching opportunity, a learning opportunity. But it was more than that. And the public was really uh, open to an explanation uh, and desperately wanted one and needed one for what was happening and where uh, Barack Obama, the new president, would lead them. I don't think he fully took advantage of that moment. Uh, uh, when will the next moment be? Very difficult to tell. My great fear is that we stay in the gravitational pull of the Great Recession for years. High unemployment, uh, anemic economic growth, a kind of angry, disgruntled politics. Uh, and we never, or we don't for many years, get to the point uh, where the public understands, is given a narrative, is given a kind of picture of what happened, uh, why it happened, uh, and where we need to go. Uh, one of the most important things a president can do is to provide that clear narrative. And although I have tremendous admiration for President Obama, he has not done that. One final question, Bob. If students are watching this program, how, and, and they actually believe in, in progressive ideals and would like to see them implemented, how, how would you advise them to prepare for the future? Well, whether they're interested in progressive ideals or not, I mean, I, I really, I, uh, in terms of my capacity as a professor at Berkeley, I do not try to make students um, believe something that they don't believe. I don't try to, in, you know, kind of inject them with progressive ideals. I want them to think hard. I want them to question their assumptions. Uh, often in class, I play devil's advocate and, and I'm the conservative. Um, my responsibility here at Berkeley is to get them to um, give up their conventional uh, views that are not based on hard thought and to really shake them up so that they think much more profoundly about important issues. But I would like them to go into public life. I do think that public service is important, regardless of what their values are. Uh, and I do urge them uh, to, whether it's, you know, uh, um, as it was some aspect of a portfolio of their careers, um, their days, their weeks, uh, whether it's a matter of running for office or becoming a, a legislative aide uh, or becoming a, an officer or an activist in a not-for-profit uh, or an advocate, uh, an organizer, um, I ask them to take an active role uh, for the good of the country. Uh, for their own good. Bob, on that note, I'm going to show one of your books, Robert Reich, Aftershock, but I do want to say that I recommend also Locked in the Cabinet, which uh, I think is still a, a great read. Uh, thank you very much for taking the, the time to be here. 
Thank you, Harry. And it was a great pleasure to have you. My pleasure. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.